Hi, and welcome to Talking Sunday Readings. My name is Tim, and I'm joined as always by Anne and by Pastor Dick Stadler. And we're going to talk about the readings for the second Sunday in Lent. And they are Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. Uh, Romans chapter or two uh, kind of sections from Romans, uh, Romans 4, 13 to 25, and 5, 1 to 11. And then the gospel is going to be from Mark chapter 8, 27 through 38. A reading from Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants, after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Um, just to kick things off, I have a few questions um, about our reading in uh, our first Old Testament read lesson here. Um, <clears throat> maybe it's just the translation that I read, but the wording struck me as odd in that it says that God appears to Abram, which struck me as odd because usually he's accompanied by great sort of fanfare there's always some sort of smoke or fire or or uh, um, big kind of cataclysmic events and his appearance is always a big deal but here he just kind of appears and i wonder why is the hat um why how did he appear um did he just appear out of nowhere was there what can we glean about that or what, why why is this one different than than the other times he's been asked uh, he shows up and then uh as Abram and God talk, he charges Abram to be blameless in his dealings. And that strikes me as a pretty big task, a pretty big thing for him to charge him to do. And what does it really mean to be blameless? And does Abram, is Abram blameless in his, in his actions? Because I don't know, a lot of stuff happens in the, in, in Abram's life. And I'm wondering what, what you guys have to say about that. So if you guys have any insights you could share and take it away well uh i will start. um when a text does not tell us the appearance of god when he appears to people mm -hmm. um then um I, I just don't know how we can uh guess what it looks like uh, there was a kind of occasion when three men showed up at abraham's tent and he um feeds them with uh, sarah's help and um, eventually those are identified as angels that go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and destroy them. Uh, <clears throat> but in this case, um, we just don't know how we appear to him, whether it was just a voice coming out of a cloud or, I mean, we know in Exodus that God appeared in a burning bush mm -hmm. to, to Moses, but uh, I, I think our best answer is we don't know. Okay. Why, and, why would it be that that it's not recorded is there a reason can we glean from that is there a conjecture i guess it'd all be conjecture but i'm just curious why that would be different here as opposed to other times well not every other time does it say that what his appearance was when he appeared to uh, different patriarchs and so i think um maybe what we can glean from this is that um it's not important uh, that god is a spirit and therefore he doesn't have to have a physical appearance 
in order to communicate with people. And that uh, it's always a mystery. How did he communicate with the prophets so they could say on behalf of God, they often spoke in the first person as if God himself were speaking when they, they were making their prophecies. Uh, we don't know how they communicated that to them. Uh, we do know every once in a while that God communicates through dreams to his people. Uh, but, so maybe that's part of the emphasis is that the important thing is the communication, not necessarily the, the appearance of God at the time when he appears to Abraham. But and, anything else? Well, I, yeah, I think that it's it's interesting that Abraham knew him. Mm -hmm. that, that somehow it's powerful enough that Abram recognizes that this is this is something beyond him. So whatever it was, it's it's more than you've ever experienced before so somewhere it's somehow you know it's it's god and abram knew him and i guess if somebody comes and tries to appear to you and says i am god the almighty then you have to stop and listen to him and um and that's all i that's my conjecture that's my gleaning from the text is that perhaps it isn't so much that that god identifies himself in any particular way but that abram believed it what I think is important for people to hear as they listen to this text read or as they read it themselves is the over and over emphasis that it's all God's doing throughout this whole thing. Just listen to these phrases starting in verse two. Uh, my covenant between me and you uh, I'm making and may multiply you greatly. That's God's doing. And then he also says, I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. That's God's doing. And I will make you into nations. Kings shall come from, uh, from you. Um, I will establish my covenant with you, uh, God. And then um, I will. This is a covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And so everything is God's doing in this covenant. Um, he doesn't say if you do A, B, and C. It's a unilateral covenant, just like the covenant God made with Noah that we talked about last week. And so um, it, people can listen for the, all of those indications uh, right up to the very last verse where he says, I will bless Sarah, that's his doing. And uh, she will give you a son, that's God's doing. And I will bless her and she will become nations. Uh, kings of people shall come from her. That's all God's doing. And so you wanna see this uh, emphasis throughout the whole reading as people listen to it. Um, I think you uh, had another question, and that is about the changing of the names. Um, uh, it's interesting that he changes Abram, which means the exalted father, to Abraham, the father of multitudes. He changes Sarai, which means my princess, to simply Sarah, princess. Then she doesn't belong to anybody. Nobody can call her mine. Okay, uh, she's her own individual uh, person for God. And, and if you notice all the other times in uh, Genesis when people's names are changed, it starts a new chapter in their lives. You remember how when God gives uh, Jacob the name Israel after wrestling with him all night, um, that begins a whole new uh, chapter in his life. And here, uh, God is going to start a whole new chapter in Abraham and Sarah's life. And they're going to be way past the age of childbearing, but they're going to have a child. And that's going to open up a whole new world for them and for the whole rest of the world, too. Kind of neat. Mm -hmm. A reading from Romans. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs... Faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace, and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, 
the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Okay. Um, well, and then if we want to keep moving here, we'll move on to the epistle lesson. Um, and as usual with the epistle lessons, I would just love to get a little more historical context as to what they're talking about and, and what this, this is a lesson that I've, I've heard millions of times and just wondering if there's any, any, uh, uh, you know, any background or anything you guys can, uh, share. Well, when the fathers of the lectionary decided to pull these readings together, uh, these really have a tight fit. Because uh, in this, in the first reading, which some people will hear, uh, and then others won't, they'll hear the second reading uh, from Romans 5, he really emphasized, he goes right back to the covenant with Abraham. And he says, Abraham was given this promise uh, to have offspring. Um, he did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And if you remember what's said in the uh, Old Testament, it says that um, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. And it's that identification that Paul really jumps on here in the book of Romans to emphasize that we are justified because righteousness is imputed to us, not because we've done something according to the law to qualify ourselves. And so people can look for that tight connection between Abraham in the Old Testament lesson and the first reading from Romans 4. If I could add, Romans was, was written by Paul to the church in Rome that was made up of both Jews and Gentiles. There's this new Christian church that was made up of Jews who understood the law and Gentiles who didn't. And at the time of of the, the organization of the church or the coming together of all of these people, there was the big a controversy and question of does a person have to become a Jew before they become a Christian and Paul here then says that that you become that there was this man of faith his name was Abraham and God came to him and actually God came to him before he gave the law before he gave the Ten Commandments so there's some connection between believing God believing his word and and then and God saving you and it doesn't have to, you don't have to be a Jew then. You don't have to, you can be a Gentile and, and by faith, you come into relationship. It isn't, you don't have to then become a Jew and follow all those laws before you can be part of the family of God. And that's, um, that's really important. It's important for the church. Then it's important now mm -hmm. as well to understand that God loved us, that God, as, as Dick said, gave this unilateral covenant. He's going to take care of it all. He's going to set up some guidelines. He's going to help us live better lives. But it's all up to him that he's done it, and anybody is welcome. And I think one of the risks that people run in Christianity when they talk about we're saved by faith alone, um, and then that any good works flow from that faith. And so faith is never without good works. Uh, it's just that God produces them as fruits of faith. Um, the danger is... Yes, but do I have enough faith? Do I have the kind of faith that I'm supposed to have? The right kind, you know, and so forth. And um, 
this verse and the next reading are both going to remind us, look to God, soak up what God has done for you, because he's done it all through his son, Jesus. And so when you start to have doubts or wonder about your faith, instead of looking to your faith, looking to yourself, look to Christ, fill your heart with Christ, read passages about the, what he's done for you, and let that fill you, because that will give you faith that will strengthen your faith that's the one thing you can do for your faith okay a reading from romans therefore since we have been justified through faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of god not only so but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Okay. Um. But the next section, uh, we're going to go on to Romans 5. Yeah. That, that yeah. portion. Yeah. That really connects also with the, the Old Testament reading because here again, Paul talks about all the accomplished facts that give us faith and that assure us that we are saved. Uh, for example, he says, uh, we have peace with God because that's something that Christ done for us. And then he goes on to say, God's love has been poured into our hearts. God has done that through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And uh, that also is an accomplished fact. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is such a great comfort to us, imperfect sinners. And uh, it just tells us that uh, God has done that for us as an accomplished fact. Uh, we have been justified by his blood. We now have received reconciliation. It, it, it just comes as hammer blows throughout this whole reading of all of the things that God has done for us. And so if we focus on him and what he's done, then that is what will fortify us in our faith. Anything else on that section? No. Romans is a, is a book that needs to be read over and over and over. And, and Paul is so dense need to stretch out his sentences and and put antecedents in and draw arrows around and he's he's good but he's not easy well, and if you remember uh, how he wrote this he wrote this to a congregation he had not yet been to mm -hmm. so he did not found this congregation like he had for many of the people who he writes letters to and so he this is one of the most organized treatments of the christian faith mm -hmm. and he's trying to give it to them all and I just think it's rich. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible mm -hmm. because it's got so much in it, but it is dense and mm -hmm. you just have to kind of read it carefully mm -hmm. and slowly. Okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, Others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. 
Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Well, that's all there. Then I guess we'll move on to the gospel this week. Um, This is another one that I've heard quite a lot, but reading it again for this, I was struck by a couple of things. Um... Jesus asks his disciples, uh, who do, who do people say that I am? And, uh, the answer is some people say this, some people say that. And, um, this is more, I guess, a question of, of my timeline and facts, but one of them, one of the answers is that some people say that you are John the Baptist and maybe again, my timeline is off, but didn't, wasn't John the Baptist just killed in a fairly public way? Why would people think that he was John the Baptist? Um, and then, as we go on through the reading, um, uh, Peter proclaims that he uh, that Jesus is the Messiah, and but then later on Peter rebukes Jesus, and I thought, my goodness, what chutzpah Peter had to 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 rebuke the Messiah? Like, where did that come from? And and how just it just struck me as odd that he had he had the gall, I guess, to 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 talk to him in that way. Um, And I'm wondering what kind of insights you guys have uh, as to what Peter was thinking and uh, and what was going on uh, in the world at that time. So, Ken, you want to start? Sure. Um, John had was had been executed. Mm -hmm. Um, When you say it was public, yes, it was because it was done in John in Herod's palace. it wasn't, it wasn't as public as Jesus's execution in front of thousands and thousands. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have an answer for this because the Jews did not believe that someone would come back from the dead. Um, my answer is that maybe people thought that John had escaped or, mm-hmm. um, and that this, that this was John or that they didn't know John. So they presume, they assumed that maybe Jesus was that same guy, John, that they were all talking about. That's just my conjecture. Okay. That's just my conjecture. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. You want to answer that, Dick, and then we'll go. On well, to uh, just on that same point, um, mm-hmm. in Mark six fourteen, which is ahead of our reading, uh, it says people thought Jesus was John resurrected. Okay. Then in John uh, in Mark six sixteen, two verses later, it says what Herod heard what Jesus was doing, he believed that it was the John uh, who he had killed who came back to life. And so this was apparently floating around uh, the, uh, the community um, that somehow John had come back to haunt Herod and, and, and he was doing all, all these things. Um, we know that contrary to what you'll hear some critics say, Jews did believe in a resurrection of the dead. Um, uh, the, you'll hear some critics say, oh, no, Jews never believed in a resurrection. That, that's not entirely 100 percent true. Uh, the, the, and so. I would say they believe there's the resurrection of the dead at the end of time, but did they believe that someone would come back in the middle? Well, uh, nobody did because Jesus is the first one who did it, you know, yeah. and then he did, and did these right. But there was a, a general belief in, in the resurrection. Uh, mm-hmm. You're right. There was, uh, but they may have thought, okay, but well, this guy's the exception, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But to get to your second question, and that is, um, Peter's rebuke of Jesus. Um, 
we aren't told the exact words that he uses here, but in Matthew's version of this story, Peter says to Jesus, after Jesus says, well, I'm going to go and suffer and I'm going to die and then I'm going to rise from the dead. He apparently ignores the good news and he only focuses on the bad news that he's going to die. And he says, far be it from you, Lord. Now, that couldn't apply to his resurrection. I don't want you to uh, rise. But it's to the death and the uh, suffering that he's going to go under. This shall never happen to you. And so uh, he rebukes Jesus for even saying that. And, and maybe thinking uh, that he's being a, a really loyal disciple. We'll do whatever we have to do to keep you from getting killed. Okay, uh, he, he doesn't understand at this point that death is his mission. And, and that's how he's going to benefit Peter and all the world. Uh, and so uh, Jesus, then the same word is used, rebukes him back. And uh, what gave him the chutzpah? Um, one, the more I've studied Jewish education and the more I've studied with Jews, the more I've been amazed at how their whole system of educating is based on asking questions. And the rabbis and the teachers will stimulate their students to do it. And when you go to yeshiva, which I had a chance to do in Jerusalem one year, uh, and watch them study, they break students. There were a thousand students in this one uh, assembly hall, and they were in teams of two. And the uh, rabbi would give them a text that they were supposed to study. Well, that meant that they were to ask each other questions about it and whatever. And if they had a question that they couldn't quite get to the bottom of, they called the rabbi over and he wouldn't give them the answer. He'd ask them another question. <laughs> and so that ability or that inclination, I think, goes back all the way to the time of Jesus, that students of a rabbi, disciples of a rabbi were constantly being provoked to ask questions. And so. Peter must have felt comfortable in saying, this, is, this isn't going to happen to you. And maybe thought he was proposing a real loyalty to Jesus by saying, and we'll keep it from happening to you. But he only listened to the part of the message and completely forgot, forgot about the resurrection part. So, um, I don't know if that makes sense. Andy, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I, my only comment would be that if if the if the disciples thought that Jesus was an earthly, if he was the anointed one who was going to overthrow Roman oppression, he wasn't going to achieve that mission if he got killed. Right. So if you are the leader of um, a, a movement to overthrow a government, then you can't die. So Jesus, what are you talking about? What are you talking? That we have to be this. If it, this is if if you you want us to follow you, we're assuming that you're going to be successful. Therefore. Um, death is out of the question mm. and and again if they were good friends I think Peter would have I, I just think that that walking along that was my what the thing that I take most out of out of being in Israel is all of the walking that these people did together all of the conversation all of the questioning um he they were they were tight they were a tight group and and Jesus wasn't on a pedestal. Jesus was right there. He was their rabbi, but they engaged all the time in conversation. And that Peter would have would have just been appalled. What are you talking about, Jesus? And he would have. And we know Peter didn't wasn't good to keep his mouth shut. Well, and some of the things he says are really uh, wonderful. You know, mm -hmm. other times he puts his foot in his mouth, but here uh, uh, he has just given profession of the faith that. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And um, we're shortly after transfiguration uh, in this text. And so we know that from here on to Jerusalem for his crucifixion, Jesus is going to ramp up the education for the disciples. And he's, he's the ultimate realist. He isn't going to con them into thinking that he's going to be some a great, successful military leader. He tells them, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to hand it over. And this is what's going to happen to me. And you guys got to know this ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And at first, they don't seem to catch on, but they will progressively, and especially later after his death and resurrection, when the Holy Spirit is given to them, they put all the pieces together. And I wonder if they didn't think as they sat around the fire after his resurrection and maybe even after his ascension, uh, asking each other, why didn't we put this together sooner? <laughs> why didn't we uh, figure this out when he is telling us all this stuff? Well, uh, that's just part of it, you know. But, mm -hmm. 
And he ends this section with then, uh, if you really want to follow me, you've got to learn to deny yourself. And what Peter was not denying was his, his own instincts. And that's why Jesus calls him a Satan and says, uh, you're savoring the things of men rather than the things of God. If I follow your uh, cautions, then salvation won't be accomplished. And so uh, and then Jesus broadens that lesson and says, you've got to learn to deny yourself, your own understanding of what is right, what is wrong, and take it directly from my word. You got to deny your concepts of messiahship. You got to deny your concepts of, of how salvation is accomplished. And take up your cross because it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be comfortable all the time to accept what my word has to tell you. And so, and then follow me, follow me. Don't follow your instincts and your feelings. So it, 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 it all kind of fits together, doesn't it? These readings. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it fits really, really well. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are no other thoughts, we'll wrap it up and say thank you guys for watching. Um, please like and subscribe and share this uh, with everybody. Um, please join us again next week. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.